All right, we're gonna jump right into it in this session today. Uh, we're talking about spinal cord injuries, right? All the different types of ones. So it's really something that gets emphasized a bit more at the advanced level than it does in our EMT textbook. Uh, but it's really just a helpful review all around to understand you know, a little bit more about why we're concerned for things like a C-spine injury and the different ways that it could potentially present. Right, so kind of, again, the EMT level really talks about it a little bit more from the standpoint of just kind of spinal cord injuries and here's how to manage them, right? The more advanced level really dives into uh, different types, right? Anterior cord syndrome, brown saccard syndrome. So we're going to cover all of those. Just recognize, again, those are probably a little bit more for the advanced level. So if you're prepping for EMT, um, maybe don't get hung up as much on the terminology, um, push yourself, you know, later with it for sure. But if you're looking at, you know, prepping for EMT exams and national registry, some of the unique particulars about the different types may be, again, a little bit less emphasized. So we're doing a little bit of anatomy uh, kind of review before we jump into the actual types of spinal cord injuries. Uh, the first one is obviously just going through the spinal column, right? So all the vertebrae, right? Remember our spinal column, all those vertebrae, so they're protecting the spinal cord that's kind of running down uh, the middle, more or less, of it. So we're going to see that in just a second, too. So with the spinal column, right, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccyx is kind of the top-down order of the different types of uh, vertebrae, or the different sections, right, or different segments of it. So cervical is up top there, right, and that's seven, right? There's seven different uh, vertebrae that are up there, right? And they start C1 for cervical vertebrae number one, all the way down to C7, right? So it's C1, C2, two, C3, four, five, six, seven, right? Top down, right? C7, right? It's kind of that bonier part, right? If you kind of felt on the lower back of your neck, there's typically one part that pokes out a little bit more than all the others. That's typically C7, right? So that can be kind of a good um, anatomical benchmark in your assessment for saying, hey, you know, if I felt this step off or this deformity or uh, tenderness on palpation, is it above that spot? It would be a cervical injury potentially. If it's below that spot, right? A little bit below that, we're probably looking more thoracic, right? So it can be kind of a good, uh, again, point in that to give you an idea is this a potential cervical injury versus a thoracic injury, right? So C7 is that bonier part back there. Remember C1 is also called the Atlas, right? Atlas, if you go back to mythology stuff, Atlas was the guy that held the, old, the, the earth on his shoulders, right? And so if you think about that vertebrae that's holding the earth, our head on top of it, Right, that's the atlas, right? That's the guy holding it up, right? So atlas and then C2 is axis, right? And those are the special ones that allow for a lot more, you know, mobility and movement and rotation compared to all the rest of the vertebrae, right? So it's really that the shape and the design there of that C1, C2 joint, right? That's really allowing for, again, a lot more movement for us to be able to move our head around on top of our vertebrae, right? The rest of the spine has a pretty good amount of give, right? And bend and twist, but not nearly as much as our head, right? So that's that special shape with those top ones. All right, continuing down, right? Thoracic right, is 12, right? So then it resets, right? Now we're at thoracic one up top all the way through thoracic 12 on bottom. And so again, you can kind of just always go kind of order segment that way. Lumbar is five, right? L1 through L5. Sacral is five. Again, just kind of continuing further down. And then the coccyx is four. Most of the time, some books will say three to five uh, fused together, right? Between the sacrum, uh, the sacrum really kind of articulates or kind of connects there with the pelvis. Right, that's that connection point. And then the coccyx is kind of your tailbone, right? So then it kind of continues down there. Can't really see it, uh, but it would be kind of back there hanging down behind the pelvis. Right? 
So 7, 12, 5, 5, 4. Right? And again, that four is typically three to five fused together, but kind of more often than not, you'll hear it phrased as four. Right? So those are the, the segments, the sections of the spinal column. Right? Getting within the spinal column, now we go into the spinal cord. Right? And I'm going to show this running down between the vertebrae or through the vertebrae in just a second. So spinal cord anatomy has a similar parts, right? We talked about the uh, cervical spinal cord, right? thoracic cord, right? It's just the different segments of it really kind of matches with it. And we're not going to get too crazy in depth into these different spinal tracts, right? But we're understanding that there's a few different component pieces to it, right? There's anterior um, and posterior segments of it. Right, so the anterior segment of the spinal cord, the posterior segment of the spinal cord. And then we also talk there's spinal tracts that are running up, ascending, and that are running down, descending. Okay. So kind of for simplicities when we think about it, if our brain is sending a signal out to the body, right? maybe it's that signal going from the brain out to your biceps so that you bend your arm. right? That's going to be a motor spinal tract that's gonna be going down and then out to innervate your bicep. Okay. So the descending ones are oftentimes things like motor control, right? That voluntary motor control, right? It's the signal the brain wants to get that signal out to the body. Well, it has to send that signal from the brain down the spinal cord until it exits the spinal cord to go over to whatever area of the body it needs to. Okay. So those are descending. Ascending one's kind of the flip side, right? Our body is constantly collecting information and sending that information up to the brain so the brain can decide what it wants to do about it, right? So a lot of our sensory nerves, right? Sensory nerves, they're sensing the outside and the internal environment. And then it's sending that signal from the body to the spinal cord and then up the spinal cord to the brain, right? So if you touch uh, something hot, or let's just say we feel that the, the air is hot outside, right? Nerves on our skin, pick it up, right? send that signal up the spinal cord to the brain. That's an ascending spinal track. So that the brain can get the signal that says, hey, it's hot outside. Okay, cool. Here's what I'm going to do about it. Let's sweat. Let's vasodilate. Let's do these things. And those are going to send them down the descending tracks out to the body so that it can actually do those things, right? So again, few different ways of it. There's, again, like we can really go in depth into the different types, right? The fancy names for all these different spinal tracts. But for starters, we just got to understand, right? We have the ones going out to the body and we have the ones coming back from the body, right? The ones that are going out to the body are going to be descending down the spinal cord until they exit. And then the ones that are coming back from the body are going to go up the spinal cord, so those are the ascending ones. Okay. Uh, the cauda equina is below L2, right? so where the purple kind of stops there. And cauda equina is horsetail. Right? So it's kind of the shape of all these you know, nerves that then kind of branch out there. Right? The, the spinal cord really is less kind of you know, a one-to-one -one where we got one nerve out, one nerve out, right? one nerve out. Now it's really it's lots, right? So they say it has that shape of a horse tail, kind of that's where they got the name for it. Right? But those are the ones that are all going down to like your bladder, bowels, lower body, legs. Uh, that's where all of those then kind of branch off to go to the lower portion of the body. Another important one, and arguably one of the more important ones is the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve is the nerve that actually goes down to what we say is innervate the diaphragm. Right, so our diaphragm is a muscle, just like our bicep is a muscle. And if we want to contract that bicep, if we want to bend our arm, we have to get that electrical signal okay, from the brain down the spinal cord, out the motor nerve to kind of fire, to depolarize, to trigger that muscle to contract so that our arm bends. Well, the diaphragm is a muscle too. And so if we want to get that muscle to fire, if we want to get that muscle to contract, to do what it's going to do in the case of our diaphragm so that we can breathe because we need that diaphragm to contract and drop down, right? We have to get that electrical signal to it. 
And so the nerve that goes down to innervate the diaphragm is the phrenic nerve. And the little saying that we have is C345 three, four, uh, three, four, keeps the diaphragm alive. Uh, keeps the diaphragm alive. Let's see if I can spell diaphragm this morning. Keeps the diaphragm alive. And C345 is telling us that's where the phrenic nerve actually exits the spinal cord, right? So high up in C345, that's where that phrenic nerve exits to go down to innervate our diaphragm. And so if we have a spinal cord injury higher than C345, not only are we probably dealing with paralysis throughout the body, but we're also paralyzing our diaphragm, right? Because we're cutting off that signal to the phrenic nerve that gets that signal to the diaphragm. If we have a spinal cord injury below the level of C5, we may still be dealing with significant paralysis throughout the body, but the diaphragm is gonna still get the signal that it needs. So our patient is still gonna be able to breathe, right? So C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. Just remember that that one's the phrenic nerve that we're talking about. All right, so putting the two together, and we have our spinal column and the spinal cord. We have our vertebrae, right? The actual individual little vertebrae. Uh, and these are kind of looking at the, the spine from a couple different angles, right? These are the spinous processes. Uh, it's the bumpy parts, right? If you felt on your back, right? those are the bumps on the back. So that's kind of the directional point of that. Those are the bumps on the back, right? These bumps here are back there behind it on this side, right? So this is kind of looking at the spinal cord kind of through the body, right, from the inside. Yeah. So we have the big vertebral body, right, which is bone. And that's, again, you know, kind of taking that kind of load and pressure and weight, being able to actually distribute it so we can, you know, be upright and stand up. And then there's that little canal, right? There's a little opening back there, right? which is where the spinal cord is actually traveling through. Right? It's that spinal canal. Right? So that's where it's at kind of anatomically in relation to it. Uh, in between each of the vertebrae, we have those intervertebral discs. Right? When you hear people talk about they have a bulging disc or degenerative disc disease, uh, they're talking about these intervertebral discs and think about them as like little pillow cushions, right? It's keeping these vertebrae from just being bone on bone grinding, right? That's what happens if they have a degenerative disc disease, right? Those discs are degenerating, they're breaking down, they're getting smaller. Now you're gonna get more bone on bone rubbing. The more bone on bone action you have, more likely you're gonna get some things like fractures. Right? So those intervertebral discs, little pillow cushions, uh, trying to keep everything uh, right, soft and a little bit of space there in between it, um, keep kind of some of that friction down so that our body is not kind of constantly causing itself damage just by, you know, the movement of being upright. And so those are the little intervertebral discs, little pillow cushions there between them. Okay. And then exiting right, from each side, those are the spinal nerves that we're talking about. And right? the nerves that are taking those signals out to the body, right, bringing it back. Right, those are exiting kind of at each segment down the spinal cord, and right, typically one off each side, right, one main branch off each side, although pretty quickly. You see they'll kind of break down into sub branches to go to different areas, do different things. And right, so those are exiting out until we get down past that L2, that lumbar vertebrae number two. That's where it kind of turns into that cauda equina and it becomes kind of a lot more uh, branches of the nerves coming out. Now, if you looked at a cross section of the spinal cord, right, it kind of makes a little X shape there. Uh, that X shape uh, in the middle is the gray matter. The outside part is the white matter. And kind of like we have gray and white matter in our brain, we have that in our spinal cord as well. And remember brain and spinal cord, that's our central nervous system. And so there's some kind of structural similarities there between the two. Good. All right, so now, Past a little quick refresher on some of the anatomy of the spinal column and spinal cord. I'm gonna actually get into the spinal cord injuries. 
right? And the injuries, remember, they're typically classified off of the mechanism of injury, the MOI, right? To kind of describe what happened to the spine. Right? Well, we describe what happened to the spine by saying what happened to the patient, right? The body. Right? So one of them, we have flexion injuries, right? And flexing of the spine, right? Sometimes it's hard but people start thinking about the head and say, okay, well, which way is the head flexing? If we think about like flexing a muscle, everybody knows, okay, this muscle contracts. That's where we're talking about flexing, right? But with the neck, flexion is down, right? So if we're talking about the head flexes, it's the head goes down, right? So some of these, you can have more of a greater degree of likelihood of having things like associated fractures of the spinal column. Uh, versus just an injury to the spinal cord internally. Other ones, much less likely to have a fracture and much more likely to have, um, you know, maybe some ligament kind of stretching and tearing surrounding it, and then the damage and the swelling to the spinal cord. So again, some variance here, uh, but it's a little bit more important to just kind of broadly understand, you know, our categories that we're talking about. So a flexion injury, right, that would be the head kind of going down, typically is more likely where we're going to see it. Uh, maybe some fractures with that one, right? You might have it. A rotational injury, right? And you can have a rotational injury with flexion, right? Where the head rotates and it kind of flexes down, right? So you can actually kind of combine some of these as well. Again, it just depends on what did that patient's body experience. We don't always know just by looking at the patient. So sometimes we look at the context of the overall mechanism of injury and say, hey, this was a head-on collision, right? Car went into a tree. So, okay, well, we know that that car came to a stop, which means that person came forward and maybe their head went down, right? So that's where we can kind of get that index of suspicion of what might have happened to this patient by understanding, well, here's what happened to the car. And with the patient, you know, wearing their seatbelt in the driver's seat of this car, I can kind of visualize and anticipate how that patient probably moved during that accident. And now that I have kind of that mental image of how that patient moved, now I can say, okay, I'm worried about their head. I'm worried about their cervical spine. I'm worried about this, this, and this. And then you can start kind of running down your patient assessment, having a little bit more of a clue or more of an idea of what you are worried about for this patient. Doesn't mean we'll find it. Doesn't mean that they don't have something else that we find that wasn't on our radar, but at least gives us a starting point of, the types of injuries that we're worried about and our understanding that, hey, if there is this closed head injury or if there is this spinal cord injury, right, that's a rapid transport to a trauma center, right? They may need neurosurgery. And so it's also kind of reiterating and reinforcing that platinum 10 minutes, that golden hour of keeping our patient, you know, moving steadily towards that definitive care that they're going to need if they do end up having one of these injuries that we're worried about. Right, so flexion, or sorry, flexion, uh, rotation, vertical compression or axial loading. Uh, you could think about if you jumped off the roof and landed on your feet, uh, you're going to get a tremendous amount of force kind of traveling uh, kind of vertically through our spine. Right, much more likely to have things like um, compression fractures because of all that force just kind of uh, compressing the spinal column. And so more likely to have some, some things like a compression fracture with a vertical compression injury or again, axial loading, right? And that goes back to our axial versus our appendicular skeleton. If we dive further into anatomy and physiology, uh, axial skeleton is the skull spinal cord, right? So axial loading is loading down, right? putting more force, more pressure, uh, more compression, on that axial skeleton, the again, the skull and spinal cord. Uh, distraction injury, right, is now the opposite, right? Vertical compression, axial loading, compressing down, distracting is pulling it apart, right? So the typical mechanism that they use to highlight that is like a, a hanging, right? Where, you know, we have that, uh, that noose that went on the neck, stretched out their spine. And much more likely to get stretching and tearing and shearing, maybe less likely to have some fractures throughout the spine, may have some fractures in the neck. So vertical compression, axial loading is compressing the spine. Distraction is stretching it out. Again, like a hanging or hangman's injury. 
Uh, that's different than distracting injury. Right? We have distraction injury and we have a distracting injury. Right? Distracting injury could be something that visually sucks us in, but it's actually a non-life-threatening injury. And we overlook something that's more life-threatening because we got focused in on this other injury. Right? Or maybe it's a distracting injury to the patient where they have something else going on and because they're so focused on that injury, we're not able to actually get the rest of the information that we need. They're too distracted by that other injury, right? So a distracting injury versus distraction, right? Is pulling traction on the spine. So be very careful with that. If we're talking about a distracting injury, is a very, very different thing than the spinal cord injury, the spinal column injury of a distraction injury. All right, and then hyperextension or extension injuries. Well, if we flex the neck, then we extend the neck back the other way. So that's where we start to think more like whiplash. If you get rear-ended by a car, right, and your body goes forward, your head kind of goes back, that's a hyperextension of the neck, generally more associated with, again, some of those muscle and ligaments, strains and sprains and tears and stretches. Maybe a little bit less likely to have some fractures associated with it. Again, there's no guarantees with some of these, uh, whether they will or won't have a fracture. There's just some that have a greater likelihood of some fractures compared to some other ones. So again, one way to classify uh, the injuries. Another way that we can classify uh, spinal cord injuries, just like we can head injuries and some of the other ones, is talking about, is this a primary injury or is this a secondary injury? Now, primary injury is an injury that, that directly occurs at the moment of you know, the impact, at the moment of the car accident, at the moment of the injury, right? or they got stabbed in the back and that stabbing you know, lacerated the spinal cord. It directly happened, like that was it. That caused the injury right then and there. Right? So it could be blunt trauma, could be penetrating trauma, it could be a cord laceration, right? but it happened right then versus a secondary spinal cord injury, which is other things that then start to happen that's gonna make that other problem worse. So maybe they have this cord laceration because of a penetrating injury to the back. That was the primary one, the cord laceration from the penetration. The secondary injury is now maybe that cord swells and that swelling causes more damage and issues. Or the uh, uh, infection sets in later and gets introduced because there was an open, uh, it was an open wound right? or ischemia, right? That hypoxia, right? That's the other things that then happen that are now going to make that cord laceration from that penetrating injury worse, right? So a primary injury right then and there versus a secondary injury is then the other things that happen that are going to make the primary injury progress worse, right? Uh, have a worse outcome, longer road to recovery, and again, worse prognosis. So the fewer secondary injuries that happen, the better off that patient's going to be. Right? So if we think about EMS's involvement, we can't change the fact that they had that car accident or they experienced that uh, penetrating trauma injury to their back. That primary injury happened. Right? But what we can do is we can try to make sure our patient doesn't go hypoxic. We can try to make sure that they don't go hypothermic. We can try to make sure that their blood sugar stays appropriate. Uh, all of those things, if, we're, if we don't get involved and they start to deal with the hypoxia or the hypothermia or the hypoglycemia, those things are gonna make that other problem worse. Right? So our treatment is really designed to, let's try to keep this problem from getting even worse. Let's try to mitigate, manage, avoid some of these secondary spinal cord injuries from happening so that the true extent of this person's issue, this person's injury, is really the primary injury. Right, so we're really trying to mitigate and avoid those secondary injuries. And the third way we can classify them right, is a complete versus an incomplete spinal cord injury. A complete spinal cord injury all the way through the spinal cord. All of those ascending and descending and anterior and posterior spinal tracts, 
all of them are affected, right? Like if somebody, if they completely lacerated all the way through their spinal cord, complete, right? They're not going to have any sensation, any pain, any movement below the level of that injury, right? It's complete, right? No electrical signal from the brain or to the body is getting through that injury because it's a complete injury all the way across. Incomplete, that's where we're going to get into some of these other um, uh, individual types of spinal cord injuries. Incomplete is just that. Not all of those spinal tracts have been affected. So maybe just this side of the spinal cord injury or the spinal cord was injured, but this side is okay. Or maybe just the front is, in, is affected, but the back of the spinal cord is okay. That means some signal is still getting back and forth. And so then it really depends, you know, how that patient presents is going to depend on which of those spinal cord, uh, spinal tracts are still allowing that signal to go through. Maybe they have some sensation, but they don't have any movement because it affected the uh, motor nerve tract, right? The voluntary motor tract. Maybe they have some motor control, but they don't have uh, proprioception, right? That kind of spatial awareness of their body. And it's because of a different segment or a different section of that spinal cord is actually affected. So they retain some sort of cord functions. So it really is, again, like I said, it's dependent on what part of the cord is actually being affected. So one of them, right, these are all, uh, these four or five that we're going to cover, these are all uh, incomplete spinal cord injuries, where just some of it is being affected. So in the anterior cord syndrome, anterior is the front. And remember, this is looking at the spine from the front, like through the body, because on the other side of that, that's the bumpy parts on the back, right? So the anterior cord is talking about the anterior portion of the cord. Makes sense, right? It's in the name, right? So they'll have paralysis and loss of pain and temperature sensation below the injury because those are all spinal tracts that are on the anterior spine, right? the anterior portion of the spinal cord. So that's the part that is not allowing the signal. So those things are gonna be what is negatively affected. The posterior tracts is where you get things like proprioception and sense of touch. So those are still functioning because the posterior spinal cord is not affected. It's just the front of the spinal cord. It's like the front two thirds or something like that. So proprioception, again, that remember that's your kind of spatial awareness of your body, right? So you could make, you know, hand signals and stuff like that behind your back. And you can kind of visualize a little bit. You understand where your hands are in relation to the rest of your body, right? And then the sense of touch, obviously, sense of touch, right? But pain, temperature, sensation, uh, motor control, those are all on the anterior spinal cord tracts. So the patient won't have those below the level of the injury. Right? So if this is, you know, a high thoracic injury where this anterior cord syndrome injury is occurred, then it's going to be everywhere below that injury is where we're going to have these. If it's lower down on the spinal cord, then it's, again, those, those issues are only going to show up below the injury. Right. Everything above it is still getting that signal to and from the brain just fine. So it's only dependent on just where, it, where along the spinal cord has this happened is going to kind of dictate, you know, how much of that body is going to be affected. And so that's the anterior cord. Right. Central cord right, is just that, central cord. It's the most common incomplete spinal cord injury. See it a little bit more often in elderly patients. Uh, you get a hyperextension, typically without the fracture. Right? So remember, hyperextension that's going back, again, not typically associated with fractures. I said that earlier. Hyperextension is a little bit more, you know, ligament, muscle, right, strains and stretches and tears, those things. Less likely to have some associated fractures. The spinal cord still has this injury. Right? That's always important to understand, right? We're talking about the spinal cord being injured, the vertebrae around it could be completely fine structurally, but the cord inside suffered this injury, right? There's not a particularly large opening there. So there's not a lot of room for, you know, swelling to occur in that spinal cord. 
before it's going to start to kind of compress itself because of the you know spinal canal that it's actually in. So again, we're talking spinal cord injuries. The vertebrae, again, maybe there's fractures, maybe there's not fractures, right? but the injury of the cord has happened. Okay. So with central cord syndrome, you have a greater loss of function in the upper extremities, right? The, the nerves that are responsible for kind of innervating and sensing everything in the upper extremities are a little bit more consolidated in the center of the spinal cord compared to you know, the outer section of the spinal cord, uh, the more kind of peripheral piece of it. More of the peripheral part of the spinal cord is more uh, likely to, you know, innervate and go down to the lower extremities. The center part of the cord more likely to impair or impact the upper extremities. All right, now posterior cord syndrome, kind of the opposite of our anterior cord syndrome, is now just the back of the spinal cord is affected and not allowing those signals to go back and forth. So the posterior cord, right? That's the one that we said, touch and proprioception. And those are kind of the main ones, not the only ones, but kind of the main ones. So that's gonna be what has the issue. All of the sensory motor, uh, the other sensory and motor control that's more on the anterior portion, that part's gonna be fine. Right. It's more this kind of spatial awareness proprioception and that sensation to touch. That's going to be more impacted because that's on the posterior spinal tracts. And so if we have a posterior cord injury, that's going to be what we see. Right. So this is a little bit, again, just I'll go back a couple slides, understanding which pieces, again, are impacted um, on the back of the spinal cord versus on the front of the spinal cord. Right. And it's just going to be opposite front of the spinal cord, paralysis, loss of pain, temperature. Proprioception though, that's fine. Posterior cord is gonna be flip-flop. Proprioception is gonna be in, uh, in, impacted. Pain, temperature, and motor control, probably still gonna be okay. Right? Different segments of the spinal cord involved are gonna present different ways. Uh, and brown saccard syndrome is a hemisection so now, let's say, for example, just one half right, or one side of the spinal cord got lacerated or injured. Right, this one, a common kind of mechanism scenario that comes up, somebody that was stabbed in the back just off center. Right? They weren't stabbed directly through their spine. They were stabbed just off center or a gunshot wound just off center. Right, so that's going to impact just the side of the spinal cord. So it causes complete damage to all of the spinal tracts just on the injured side. Right, so now you're going to get kind of interesting issues showing up on one side of the body, but not the other side of the body. Because this side of the body, the spinal cord is okay. This side of the body, the spinal cord got lacerated uh, completely on that side. And so we're going to have issues below the level of the injury on that side. So one of them, loss of motor function and proprioception on the affected side. So again, just kind of continue to hit it, right? The posterior part is our proprioception, right? P, P, right? Posterior is proprioception. And then the anterior is the motor control, right? So if both of those have been damaged. Both of those aren't going to be functioning but just on that side, right? So this one, typically what it is, again, we have some sort of trauma scenario mechanism description in a question, and we clearly identify they suffered some sort of injury. And as we kind of get that more information, if they start talking about issues showing up on one side of the body below the level of the injury, it's this brown scarred syndrome, brown scarred syndrome. So loss of motor function, proprioception on the affected side. Motor function paralysis one, that's gonna be kind of the more immediately obvious one to us. We'll see that they can't move that side of their body or below the level of the injury on that side of the body. Um, other ones like loss of you know, pain sensation might take us another minute of an assessment or loss of temperature uh, sensation. So loss of temperature sensation, sorry, temperature sensation. Uh, 
that's going to be a little, again, we're not really going to be able to pick up super obviously that, hey, this person can't feel hot or cold uh, on their left leg because they had this browns card syndrome on the left side or on the right side, actually. Um, so again, it, those are going to be less obvious. The motor function one is going to be the big one because pretty rapidly we start taking manual C-spine stabilization, right? grips, pushes, and pulls really quickly. We'll find out, hey, they don't have any motor control on that side. Then we'll start to find they can't feel anything. Then we'll start to find you know, everything else after that. So loss of motor function and proprioception on the affected side, loss of pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side, we call contralateral opposite side. Uh, and that's just the way that those spinal tracts actually work. Right? Those are kind of responsible for the opposite side, the kind of crisscross there. Another one, cauda equina syndrome. Again, is compression of the cauda equina, right? the horse tail part there below uh, the lumbar spine, right? lumbar vertebrae two, remember? So typically it's gonna present with lowered back pain, altered loss of sensation in the legs, bowel bladder dysfunction. Again, I said it's all lower body stuff, right? because that's where the cauda equina is responsible for getting those signals out to. So it's all gonna be lower extremities, lower body, um, bowel bladder, problems because those are the areas again that are infected. Everything above that injury is fine. So those signals are still going out to the upper extremities fine, right? We're not having any issues up there. It's always below the level of the injury. So if we're having a compression down there in the cauda equina, it's gonna be below the level of that compression. That's where we're gonna to start to have those issues. So all lower body and with the lower body typically goes uh, the bowel bladder uh, issues like incontinence as well. All right, management of these, first off, recognition, right? As early as possible, we're trying to recognize that we're concerned that our patient is having a spinal cord injury because we can't really do anything definitively about that. So we need to recognize it so that we can get transport going, again, to a trauma center uh, with neurosurgery capabilities, right? Being able to actually definitively manage that patient. So step number one, we got to recognize it say, hey, I'm worried about a spinal cord injury. Let's get rolling as quick as possible. Right? After that, general ABC and shock management, uh, nothing kind of different there than how it always is. If the patient's not breathing, we're going to ventilate the patient. If the patient is displaying any signs of shock or we're at all worried about the progression towards shock, let's manage our shock. Right? Spinal restrictions, Right, or spinal immobilization, some places still call it. Some have moved away from that immobilization because even after all the strapping down, the like, patient could still move. So the lawyers got involved and said, hey, you can't immobilize the spine, but we can restrict it. Right? So some places are now saying, you know, spinal motion restrictions instead. And that's the big one that's really has kind of changed over the years. It used to be backboard everybody in the world. And any sort of trauma, back boredom. Right? And I really started to find out that that was actually causing more problems than it was helping kind of more often than not. And so it's really shifted, uh, again, in a lot of places, they're trying to get us away from just backboard everybody, no matter what. They experience some sort of trauma, back boredom. Right? To now saying, we got to back boredom, you know, intentionally and, and justifiably. Like we have some reasons why we need to backboard them. So let's you know, kind of focus on those reasons. We're not going to backboard everybody. Like if they were in a car accident, but they got out of the car and they're up and they're walking around, they probably don't have a spinal cord injury. Or if they do, backboarding them is probably not going to change anything for that injury. In fact, it might make it worse. Right? So we started to sh kind of shift and say, okay, well, we're going to backboard patients um, but maybe it's just some patients that experience the trauma, not all patients like it used to be. And so who might get it? Maybe it's a patient that experienced some sort of blunt trauma and they're altered, right? where they can't tell us if their back hurts or if their head hurts or if their neck hurts or if they can't feel or move anything. They're altered. Right? Uh, anybody that's complaining of some sort of spinal pain and tenderness, that's a more justifiable warrant, right? They're kind of giving us a clue that they are actually experiencing or have experienced a spinal cord injury. Now we can really kind of, you know, put the spinal restrictions on and hopefully prevent the, an exacerbation of that injury. 
Okay. If they have some sort of neurologic complaint, any sort of paresthesias, right? Tingling, altered sensation, weakness, numbness, paralysis. Those are all things that would much more justifiably warrant uh, the spinal motion restrictions. If there's any sort of spinal deformity, things like step offs, right? Where we can kind of work our way down the spine and feel a particularly larger bump or something there. Uh, we can say, hey, you know what? I think they have a spinal cord injury. Maybe it's just a dislocation of those vertebrae, or a partial dislocation called a subluxation. That could all be it, but we don't know. So let's assume the worst and let's hope for the best. And another one would be some sort of high energy mechanism of injury and what we oftentimes may call a poor historian. So maybe it's somebody that's you know on uh, you know drugs or they're intoxicated uh, on something where they can't communicate because of whatever reason. Now, we're, we are basing it a little bit more off of just the mechanism of injury that happened and our suspicion that uh, they may have a spinal cord injury, right? But because we have a poor historian, we can't quite, you know, comfortably validate or feel great about the answers that they're giving us because they're intoxicated. Maybe they're not feeling any of the pain yet because they're severely intoxicated, right? So any sort of poor historian can't communicate drugs, intoxication. Those are ones where we maybe say, I don't know if I can really trust that they're not having some sort of spinal pain or tenderness or numbness or weakness. I can't really trust that because of what's going on. So let me err on the side of caution and say, this was a pretty significant mechanism of injury. There was a lot of, uh, of energy that, that transferred during that accident or whatever it was. Let me go ahead and backboard them just until we can get them to the hospital. They can kind of figure out a little bit more comfortably from there with you know things like x-rays to be able to figure out if there is or isn't a spinal cord injury. So that might be another one. So again, you know, they're really continuing to shift us away from you know the registry world, backboard everybody. And I was saying, well, backboard them when it's appropriate. And, and when it's appropriate are some of these types of ones. So I hope this was a helpful little uh, session for you today. And uh, I appreciate you guys watching and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next session. See ya.